You have a story here. Of Jesus being invited to a Pharisee's house to eat. It's in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. And when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I enter into thine house, thou givest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her hand. Thou givest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. What a story. He's, at, he's there for dinner. This woman wasn't invited. She just crashed to dinner and made a scene. She never says a word to this entire narrative. Simon speaks. Jesus speaks. She's a silent actor in this scene. You see the Pharisee's attitude already in verse 39, saying to himself, if this man were a prophet, makes you wonder why he invited Jesus there in the first place then, if he thought he wasn't a prophet. But if this man were a prophet, he would have known who. Next question is, how did he know who and what man or woman she was? He wasn't a prophet. Tell me to think about it. Maybe he knew her from the past. <laughs> and so Jesus says, answering him, I don't ever see the guy ask the question. So when it says he answered him, he was answering his thoughts when he spake within himself. 
that he had not enough courage to say aloud to Jesus. Jesus wasn't no joke. You know, he's about as real as real can be. He's there for dinner. And I get the impression Jesus enjoyed dinners. He enjoyed eating. He enjoyed drinking. That's why I got the title we read Sunday. They, they call him a, a gluttonous man and a wine bearer and a friend of publicans and sinners because he was. Simple as that. Then he ran a comparison in the message saying, I didn't really preach in that part because it wasn't the main part of the message. But he says, John came neither eating nor drinking. He said, this is at least that he had a devil. He said, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they said things about him. And what Jesus was saying, actually he said that wisdom is justified of his children. What is telling them, quit judging the man and judge his message. Judge what John was saying. And likewise, judge what Jesus was saying. So they had two different lifestyles. Two different characters all together. He said, the people in the crowd are about. Which shows you cannot please people, don't try. Live for the Lord, and everybody else, you know, have at it. Because they're going to have at it, no matter what. Right? But anyhow, this is the first time, to my understanding, that he's anointed with an alabaster box of ointment which was very expensive. It, they, they sold for something like 300 pence, which was 10 months worth of wages. Right? And she came in, she recognized the value of Jesus, and she felt like Jesus deserved that. They have another anointing in the 14th chapter of Mark. And this same story is also told in the 26th chapter of Matthew. You can pinpoint it because in the 26th chapter of Matthew it says, verse 2, after two days there's a feast of the Passover. And in Mark, Chapter 14, after two days, it was the feast of the Passover. So it's the same, same episode. End of unleavened bread. And the chief priest and the scribes saw how they might take him by craft and put him to death. But they said, not on the feast day. And this guy's a hypocrite of the max. We're going to kill him. We don't have a legitimate reason to kill him. So we're going to try to take him <coughs> by craft or by craftiness. We're going to try to trick him into saying something or doing something that would merit death. He never did. And they lied on him anyhow. They went to Caesar and said that this man is a malefactor. I mean, he's a a criminal against the government. And then, that didn't carry any weight with Caesar, with uh, Pilate. So he finally said, this man makes himself to be a king. He calls himself the son of God. That's what made Pilate get serious and have a real trial. And Pilate asked him, was he the king of the Jews? And Jesus didn't answer. That's when Pilate got upset. He said, I have the power to kill you or set you free. I said, why don't, what, what do you got to answer me? Then Jesus came back with an answer of answers and said, you wouldn't have any power at all if my Father in heaven had given it to you. And that put terror into Pilate's heart. You read some other Gospels, they talk about Pilate's wife. who told Pilate not to have anything to do with this case. He said, I have suffered many things in a dream because of this man. That's not just let it go. Well now, they're going to kill him by craft, but, so I call them maximum hypocrites, but not on the feast day. Unless there be an uproar, not because of the feast day itself, but because of the people. Unless there be an uproar among the people. 
They didn't care about the feast day. They didn't care about Jesus being the Son of God. They cared about having it their way. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he said in meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now one of the differences in the story in Luke is that she poured it on his feet. This time she pours it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves. Now Matthew's Gospel records in verse number 8, Matthew 26 and 8, but when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? Mark's account says there was some that had indignation. There should have been no one. Problem here of Jesus. They saw this expression and this woman giving, you might say, a very costly offering. Verse 5, chapter 14, Mark. Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Somebody quickly find out the other location, where, the other gospel where Judas complained about. Check John. Luke 22. Luke 22. I'm going to read the <coughs> Disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, 
was to betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? You get an insight there how, how Judas could betray, could easily betray Jesus because he didn't think much of him. This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag, his treasure, and stole what was put in the bag. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Now this event takes place six days before the Passover. Right? You would think from six days to two days, how could any disciple say anything about it? After what Jesus just said here. Let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you. But me, you have not always. I was reading the scripture somewhere the other day. I have no idea where. So talk about the day when the poor no longer be with us. Can't hardly believe it. So when you get down to two days for the Passover, this woman, when she did the same thing, they had indignation about it. Okay? Now, that ain't my point at all about the boxes and so on and so forth. Point is, though, is that she said she did this. <coughs> Gets my burial. I told you when I did a wrote a commentary in the book of Mark years ago. It was never published. It's about 500 pages. I guess it was just for me. And I was confused by this. Because you read the account of his crucifixion, which I've preached so many times, Chapter 27, Matthew, verse 57. <coughs> when the evening was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded, this is the whole difference between Joseph's outlook on Jesus and Judas. Joseph was a, not just a rich man. He was probably one of the wealthiest men of his day. But he thought Jesus was worth begging for. He became a beggar for Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. That down place is part of the bed. Let's see what John says. Okay? Check out his rendition. I'm sure you know about it. being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, he saw Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, he recorded in the second chapter and the third chapter of, of the same book, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. They took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury him. They did not, just by the way, they did not bury him in a shroud. The shroud of Turn is one of the biggest lies Jesus ever told. The Jews don't bury folks in the shroud. They wrap the bodies up in linen. Okay? 
Anyhow, this can be a problem. Because he was anointed for his burial with 100 pounds of spices. Real serious anointing. So what did Jesus mean when he said that this woman did this against his burial? Because, like I said, he was anointed for his burial. Right? And I had to go to my court to find these scriptures, and I found, first time I looked at this, I only recall seeing one. Tonight, I saw three. So I'm going to read them Got a point, Steve? Yeah, I'm here. Take, take, take some time. Hang on. This class has a destination. <clears throat> Second Samuel 22. Peter made a statement that these men wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. David was not only a king, but he was also a prophet. And David had some, some tremendous prophecies he wrote. With the idea of the understanding that he was writing things a private interpretation. David thought he was writing about things regarding his own life. He had no idea he was being used by the Holy Ghost to write things about the life of the Messiah. There's one Psalm, 22nd Psalm, Peter Finger in 2 Samuel, turn to Psalms 22. I'll take this on Turn to the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sound familiar? Yeah. What the exact words Jesus said on the cross. For art thou so far from helping me? From the words of my roaring. Verse 7 All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot off the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Seeing He delighted in him. That's what they said. So He saved others. Let him save himself. Then when He spoke in tongues on the cross and said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabbath and I, He thought He was calling for one of the prophets. He said, Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. He says in verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near. For there is none to help, all his sheep scattered. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. Talking about the, the Roman army. They caked upon me with their mouths as they ravening in the roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. David again thought he was writing about his own experiences. He went through some pretty tough things, O King David. For dogs have, verse 16, for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. He was moved by the Holy Ghost to write these things. I go back to 2 Samuel. Chapter 22. Verse 
Verse 1, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. That's a testament. He doesn't say a thing about himself. This is all praising God. Let's skip forward. 17. He sent me, he sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me. For they were too strong for me. They prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord is my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. And that's the one that caught my attention. The answer God gave me. The reason for his anointing is his burial. He was about to embark on a whole new office. Are you supposed to save you? There's an office of you in there. Are you in there? Let's save you. He was about to leave the earth after accomplishing his mission of being a savior and dying for the sins of the world. And going to heaven to fulfill whole new office. But one office is going to fulfill. It'll be a high priest. That's why the writer to Hebrews. For every high priest taken from men, among men, is ordained for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. He said, the high priest can have compassion so and so forth, because he has weaknesses, he has infirmities. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So from that you can understand that there were two priestly orders. One, the order of the house of Aaron, the first high priest, Second one, the little house of Melchizedek. Aaron's line had a lot of men. I can't say offhand how many, but they come. But his son, and then his son, and his son, and on down, on and on, for over 1,500 years. The second Priestly order only had two. Now, to kiss it, and Christ. It talks about Melchizedek a little more extensively in chapter 7. Turn in. 
Well, this is Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is the ancient name of Jerusalem, priest of the Most High God. He had two offices. He was a king and a priest. King of Jerusalem, and you might say the high priest of Jerusalem, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings when Chedorlaomer came down, and blessed him. This priest here met Abraham coming back from the war and blessed Abraham, which means for Melchizedek to bless Abraham, he had to be greater than Abraham. Okay? To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being by interpretation, his name, king of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace. This part, verse 3, gives out of trouble. Shouldn't. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Then talk about how great this man was, to whom even Abraham himself, who's the greatest person, personage in Israel's history, Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes. Right? And of course, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. You see, read somewhere else it says, and the less is blessed of the better. Verse 7. Without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Okay? So, what it's telling us, it's not that he didn't have a father or a mother. Every priest. Aaron had to have records allowing him to be, to, to be a priest. Aaron was the first one. God made him high priest. Eliezer, his son, followed him. Then each one, they had to say that, you know, who was their father? How long he was a priest? When he was born? When he died? Those records had to be in place. And all the priests that ever were priests in Israel, the high priests, they all have these records. The year of the birth, the year of the death, the name of the father, the name of the mother. They could just pop on the scene and say, you know, I'm going to be a high priest. They had to come from a priestly family. Okay? What's different with Melchizedek is that God allowed his records to be lost. No record of his mother. No record of his father was. No record of his birthday. No record of when he died. Why did God do that? To make him become a type of another high priest going to be greater than him. Type of Christ. Who himself would become a high priest in heaven. And is trying to show you the never-ending aspect of the priesthood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He's a priesthood, he's a priest.